<laughs> There's nothing you can do to me. You developed such confidence. Yeah, and it was not even that, that it was, it was not even developing a confidence. It was just the way it was going to be. I would not accept anything else. I would not accept it. I mean, the thought of losing never entered my mind. I don't lose. And as a result, I kind of made, I made up a, a saying, if you will, that I have. It's only one rule I have in fighting tournament competition. And the rule is this. I'm going to hit you as many times as I can without getting hit. That is the only thing I think about. Because as you know, as a competitor, Joe, when you get in that ring, I mean, everything is happening so quick that you don't have time to consciously think of what it is you may want to do, or if you do it, well, is he going to do this to me? Shall I block, punch? And it's just too quick. So to eliminate all of the worry, like you said, and anxiety about what may possibly happen, and for the most part it won't, I eliminate all that thought, and I only think about, I'm going to hit you as many times as I can without getting hit. Now, that's a very difficult thing to do because you're saying yeah. two things. Mm -hmm. Number one, I'm being very positive and aggressive because that's how you get points. I'm going to hit you as many times as I can. That's very powerful <laughs> and it's very aggressive. But the safety factor is to make myself not get scored on is without getting hit at all. So it's a double-edged sword and it's difficult to do. It's always easy to run across and try to hit someone, but then not to get hit requires much more skill and talent than to just go across and hit someone. I know. Many people, they'll take uh, two punches to give one. That's right. Well, I don't believe in taking anything. <laughs> right. I want to be the deliverer of bad news. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that type of uh, determination de created a reputation for you that many fighters, when they heard you were competing, they withdrew. Yeah. Well, it's, That's it's, kind of a compliment. It is in a way, but you know, it, it's carried over even 20 years, 25 years later. I mean, really? people still, sure. I'm sure even yourself, right? You've known me since, since right. the old days. Right? When I was a black belt, I think you yeah. were just starting off or something. Uh -huh. And whatever you may have heard of my reputation has carried you probably to some thoughts you may have right. today about I'm me. I'm surprised how nice you are. <laughs> <laughs> that's just another, that's another me. <laughs> no, I was, uh, when I met you, uh, we've known each other, I don't know, maybe a year now. I was expecting this monster yeah, who's going to just punch out walls or something. But uh, it's good that you can control this attitude. A lot of people can't. They, they, they put on a toughness that they carry around with them, and it really kind of turns people off. But when you can reserve it for the ring, uh, that shows a lot of control. Yeah. I mean, being a gentleman outside of the ring, but inside of the ring, you're just a, you're a shark. Well, I'm, I'm even, I scare myself when I was fighting I didn't even like my personality when I was in the ring because I, I felt and was conscious that I was very different than I am when I stepped out. But again, like I said, it was such a, a mental brainwashing that I gave myself as far as developing an attitude and a confidence in winning uh, that I'm not going to, I'm not going to lose, that that is my single most thought. I'm not losing. I don't care who it is. But how do you relate this type of determination to like uh, instructors who are teaching today young children? Mm -hmm. I mean, would you tone it down a little bit? How do you uh, give them the confidence and determination? But how do you teach them to turn it off also? I mean, you're a mature adult. Yeah. I mean, when well, you're teaching Well, we've seen a lot kids. of mature adults that don't <laughs> yeah. behave right, don't have we? Yes, uh, that's true. Well, again, I don't think it's something that you can teach. I think that inner desire to win, that, that personal motivation, that spark, that's not something that can be taught. I really don't believe that. Uh, Do you think I'll you give you an example, the word potential, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's probably the most overused word in athletics. We've always, man, that guy has tremendous potential. I mean, how many people have you seen through your career in the martial arts that had that, right? Yes. That had tremendous potential. Yes. And how many of them ever many amounted sports. to that? Not many. Percentage-wise, maybe even 1%, if that. Mm -hmm. So. It's not that they can't do it physically or even that they have the, cap the mental capabilities because they all do. But I think, I think the thing that really separates the people that, that are consistent winners, that, that you and I may be considered champions, and it's something that's not physical. It's definitely not. Because if you look at all of the ones that have become very successful in tournaments, they're all physically very different. Uh, but they, I think the one key ingredient that they may all share is that one driving force that's within them that won't settle for anything else other than consistent winning. And like you say, uh, you were saying that 
physically, you don't feel you were outstanding or anything. You no, not at all. I was inferior to most of the people but I thought. your determination made up the difference, and I think that's what the audience has to understand if they want to succeed in the martial arts. Uh, many will join a karate class mm -hmm. or they'll enter competition. They'll lose one match and they'll, they'll want to quit. They, they won't be determined to follow it through and give it their best. Well, it's, it's definitely determination and persistence. I mean, those are qualities, again, I don't think you can teach. You either want to do it or you don't. And I think any, anyone will tell you in any walk of life, whether you want to be an athlete or whether you want to be good at videotaping or doing <laughs> anything else. I mean, to be the best at something it requires having a mental attitude that far surpasses just going to work every day or just being another one that's behind the camera or another guy that's putting on a uniform to work out. To be the best at something, it, you know, it takes so much extra time and dedication. You know, one thing that bothers me quite often when, <laughs> I, uh, when I hear about athl ath athletes especially, because most of the armchair quarterbacks right, that sit back and watch sports during the weekends, and I'm guilty of it myself to some degree, where I look back, and I don't do it so much in a negative sense as I do it admiring talent. Mm -hmm. I look at someone perform and I go, God, that looks easy, or that looks, you know, they make it look so easy. Or lucky. Or, or yeah, yeah, nice. the guy is lucky, or, lucky. well, I can do that. You know, the guy's making a half a million dollars a year because he's a superb athlete, and you go, I can do that. <laughs> uh, but to get out there and really do that, you can't do it. If you may, you probably won't be able to do it consistently, and that's what makes them special, that they can perform at that level consistently. And these type of people, there's really only a handful in the world. Sure, absolutely. But if we all had that mental determination, we, we could maybe not achieve that level, but we'd be awful close. Yeah, but the fun of it also is, yeah. is, is in trying. Right. You know, the, right. the, fun, of, the fun of attaining the anything is of working trying. toward it. Yeah, because it feels good. You know, one of the things we talk about, again, going back to the seminars I mentioned, but the two most important things we mention in our seminars are this. Number one, how do you feel about yourself? And how do you feel about what you do? I mean, if you don't feel good about who you are, then the quality of your work or anything that you do can't be very good. Because it's got to start with you inside. Mm -hmm. So you've got to feel good about who you are, number one. And when you do that, you'll find that anything else you do in your life uplifts, that the quality of your life and the relationships and the things that you accomplish in your life rise with that, with your self-esteem. Mm -hmm. So it's got to start with you. And Speaking of seminars, you, you've been traveling all over the world. Mm -hmm. What do you feel is uh, lacking the most with uh, martial arts in general? Is, you know, watching the students train and everything, do you, do you feel that there's um, any major uh, need for improvement? Well, I, th I think there's two things. Again, we've talked about one qu quite a lot right now, and that is the personal motivation. Mm -hmm. That, again, no matter who you get out there, if they don't want to do it, they ain't going to do it. That's all there is to it. They're right. going to just do it because their parents want them to, or it's, it's some place to go socially to meet people and, and get involved in maybe a macho-type activity. But if you don't want to do it, you're not going to do it. The other thing is the instruction, that the quality of instruction has a great deal of difference. I know in my life, what has changed my whole life around in high school was an instructor. He was an assistant football coach, and he changed my life. He's been dead for over 20 years, and yet every day when I go out to run or when I do anything that's physical to the point of exhaustion where I want to quit and give up, I always think about him. And when I get to that point, I always say, I just can't quit. But I think it's the instruction because people that are in a position as an instructor or someone, a guidance position, they can really set you on the right track or at least get you going you know, correctly. And if they can motivate you, to motivate yourself, because once they give you the basic instruction, it's up to you to go do it. They can't be with you every day, hold your hand out, throw a kick, lift your knee up. Uh, but once, if they can inspire you and motivate you to action, to get you to do the things that you may want to accomplish, and then motivate you to do that, and then you go out and take, a, you know, take it on yourself. Yes, uh, very few instructors have that quality. Uh, a lot of times, They'll only look at the physical aspects of a class, mm -hmm. push the people through basics, then you do your kicking ba on the bag, then you do your sparring. And there's no real uh, uplifting of the student's spirits, yeah. uh, well, you making know, him believe in himself. That's true. But I can let me defend the instructor now that I mm -hmm. put him up on a pedestal. Uh, the defense is that, as you know as a teacher, it is so difficult to go in day in and day out and teach karate. It is a hard thing yes. to do. It's physically exhausting. It's mentally draining. And at some point, you just get burned out from doing that over and over again. And the other thing is that you see so many people that the turnover in a karate school is so high, the percentage, that 
you may have a student that you really like and feel good about that's really going to do well. And they're the ones that are the bummers, you know. They're the ones that are not motivated. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that have all this potential we talked about that, that have no desire or persistence to excel. So you want to put your time and effort into someone like that, then three months later they quit. So yeah. now, you know, you're a downer because, like, hey, my best student just split. It's hard for the instructor to keep up. That's right. You know, keep motivated. That's right. He must be the one that is highly motivated all the time so that he can motivate others. But that's difficult to do. How should a student feel when he or she leaves a karate class? You what mean should they be daily thinking? or at the end of their after, course? What after every class. What should they be thinking about? How should they feel about themselves? Oh, they got to feel good. Well, first of all, just... I feel good if I go out, like I get up quite early in the morning, you know, to run. Mm -hmm. And just to do that, I feel good about myself and what I'm doing, the two most important things. And I think anyone that goes to any type of a program like that or to the karate school to work out, when they finish, they got to feel good that they showed up, they took the class, they went through it. It's a hard, good, strong workout. So they've got to feel good. You know, again, that, that self-esteem level rises. Mm -hmm. So I would think they feel great. I know I do. <laughs> Mike, let's go back a little bit. What was it like fighting in the 60s as compared to today? You were brought up in the hard knocks of karate. Uh, there was no such thing as safety equipment other than maybe a groin protector or mouthpiece. And yeah. uh, what changes have you seen over the years? Oh, there's been tremendous changes. Not necessarily good or bad? Or no, or not necessarily for the good, too. I mean, uh, naturally, the safety factor, I think, is, is good. Uh, the safety gear, the safety equipment, all the protective devices for competitors, I think that's excellent. We need that. Uh, the thing that's bad is that that safety factor has, has allowed their minds to slip back and not be as aggressive or as, as keen mentally in fighting because they know that they're not going to get hurt for the most part. That if you jump across and hit me with the back fist with that big bunny foot on your hand, <laughs> I'm not going to get hurt. And what that does also that's, that's not so good is that it waters down the quality of techniques because now you know there's no need to be precise there's to, no need right. to keep your mind finely tradition. tuned yeah. yeah so you know there's there's good and bad but in answering maybe your question about how it was in the early days it was so tough because like you said without any safety gear my lord i mean those guys <laughs> were and you could hear body shots ring throughout the arena you know ribs going ding ding chimes <laughs> i mean geez <laughs> And uh, how do you feel about the future of the martial arts? Well, I think it's going to be excellent. Uh, I like what movies and television has done for the exposure of the martial arts worldwide. Uh, an analogy I always make that I think is kind of funny is that I remember when I was a kid, you know, uh, if you pass any kids on the street, they'd always be boxing. You know, <laughs> that was the thing. Everybody right. would be throwing jabs at each other. This is when I was a child. And today, they're kicking at each other. The kids are going around throwing karate kicks and punches, and that's common to see. Now, the reason I feel good about the martial arts is that one point, and that is if from my childhood kicking was a, a dirty fighter, if you kicked at anybody or did anything right. like that, you were dirty considered fighting. a dirty fighter, and that was a no-no. But today, our whole society has accepted kicking and glamorized it. Mm -hmm. Not only is it accepted, they wish they can do it. So to make that mental transition in 20 years in a country that that was considered dirty, now highly acceptable and even sought after as a way to perform, uh, I think it's going to be around for a long time. It's definitely overtaken the Westerns. <laughs> and you're credited with uh, initiating the ninja craze in America. You wrote the screenplay for the movie Enter the Ninja, yes, which sir. is a great hit. And you choreographed many of the ninja fight scenes. Uh, Ninjas are real big right now, yeah. and you're very big into the motion picture industry as producer, director. Do you see any other trends happening in the martial arts? Do you think it's losing its popularity, or it's growing, or the... The martial arts as a whole, or the ninja? Well, the, the, the ninja aspect of it. Do you think something will overshadow that, or is that oh, the yeah, thing right so. now? Oh, yeah, I think so. I think you'll always have, you know, this, this cannot last forever. There's going to be something But else. what's next? Well, <laughs> hopefully I can be the one that starts it, right? Uh, I, I think possibly two things that I would like to see, and I'm going to start using them more and more, and as a result, maybe have some creative control in, in making a change. But I like Aikido very much, and that's like going back to my roots, like I said. And I like uh, Kendo and swordplay. So, so we, we might see an emergence of those yeah, two. Yeah, or even a blending of the two uh, somehow. 
But, uh, you know, the, the, the Ninja thing, again, if, if we look back at its short, brief history right now as far as cinematically in this country, mm -hmm. it's been in around, uh, in around Japan for quite a long time, and I used to watch